We the people. We the people tell the government what to do. Let me ask you this. When is the last time you asked the government to do something and they listened? That is to say, is your voice actually being heard? What was once a government of the people, by the people, for the people, now seems to be a system largely against the people. But why is that? The people are retarded. No, 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 it's not that. It is because the government serves a different master. A master that pays better than you. A master that has interests of its own. Bingo! Some of which are diametrically opposed to the wants, needs, and even health of the people. <laughs> Taxes should hurt. Just as we have a separation of church and state, so too do we desperately need a separation of business and state. Big business's infiltration of the government is a complex issue to tackle. So to help us understand the issue, we sat down with comedian turned libertarian political commentator, Dave Smith. Are, are you ready to go? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Who has been outspoken about the issue for years now. But if you just think of like 2020, where the government is forcibly shutting down mid-sized and small businesses all across the country, and then giving out trillions of dollars in handouts to big business. It really matters how much you're in with government. Okay, wait, let's back up for a second. I started this company. You know how much I sacrificed? Imagine that you are running a Fortune 500 business. Imagine all the blood, sweat, and tears you put into building something from the ground up. Now imagine that you're way ahead of the competition. You've scaled your business and your product is the go-to for nearly everyone. You've mastered the game. You have become so successful that there is virtually nothing else you can do to increase your profit, except by changing the laws in favor of your business. Now, there are two ways that you can do this. One of which is to lobby and the other is to infiltrate or as it is officially called, capture. As you probably already know, there are systems in place to stop businesses from engaging in illegal, harmful, or unethical practices. These systems are called regulatory agencies. But what happens when those agencies get infiltrated? Take Gary Cohn, for example. Cohn is the former COO of Goldman Sachs, where he made $1.8 million per year. In 2016, he walked away from his career at Goldman Sachs to become President Trump's top economic advisor. On his way out the door, Goldman Sachs decided to pay him a whopping $285 million. A weird move to make when one of your best employees leaves. That's because there's more to this story. While at the White House, Cohn, along with another former Goldman Sachs executive, implemented a tax plan that cut the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. This move saved Goldman Sachs around $1 billion per year. And right after this, Cohn left his government position. He spent a mere 14 months in office. Impressive, very nice. This corruption goes the other way as well. Sometimes, regulatory agents will quit their government jobs to work in the big businesses that they were just regulating. Just look at the FDA. In a 2016 study, researchers examined the job histories of 55 FDA staff members who had conducted drug reviews over a nine-year period. They found that 15 of the 26 employees who left the agency later worked for the biopharmaceutical industry. Conflict of interest? I'll leave it up to you. This phenomenon is known as the revolving door, a pathway for government and business. In some cases, industry leaders will trade the promise of future jobs for regulatory consideration. The revolving door is criminal and corrupt, and it happens in almost every major industry. It involves both Democrats and Republicans. 
creating an entire ecosystem of conflicting interests. I'm floating my resume to some big banks. How's your brother, by the way? How are you floating your resume to big banks? I mean, you're supposed to be the ones, you know, policing the big banks. I mean, Grow up, Jamie. There must be some kind of law against working for a financial institution right after you've been working in financial regulation, <laughs> right? No. You often hear those on the left argue for more regulation of business, and the right argue for less government control and more free market. Unfortunately, they are caught in a false dichotomy a illusory paradigm. It is impossible to debate the topic without recognizing the revolving door between government and business. Insider just completed a five-month investigation finding that 49 members of Congress and 182 senior congressional staffers have violated the Stock Act, um, the Insider Trading Law. I'm wondering if you have any reaction to that, and secondly, should members of Congress and their spouses the ban from trading individual stocks while serving in Congress. No, I don't know to the second one. Insider trading is the act of trading in a public company's stock by someone with non-public information about the company. It allows you to profit off investments without having to take much risk, while simultaneously suffocating stockholders that don't have the same inside scoop, putting them at an extreme disadvantage. In act, former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and her husband, Paul, have been accused of many times. Nancy Pelosi's net worth has increased by over $140 million since the 2008 financial crisis. This massive jump in wealth in such a short period of time is apparently attributed to her husband's ability to predict and trade stocks. Why are you buying that? The CEO was just indicted. But not for the big fat defense contract he bribed his way into. That's still on. Like when Paul Pelosi bought $5 million worth of Tesla stock as his wife pushed for electric vehicle subsidies. Or when he poured $5 million into NVIDIA, a graphics card manufacturer. And this occurred just weeks before the House considered a bill to put $50 billion towards semiconductor manufacturers in the US. Moderna, Johnson Johnson, uh, Pfizer, like same thing happening. So you have like the big tech companies that are kind of censoring this COVID misinformation. And at the same time, the companies that are benefiting from censoring the COVID information are also revolving. No, you're right, you're right. And just one more point on the revolving door thing is it's not even always you don't even always have to go through the door. Nancy Pelosi is like been in government since I was a teenager, you know? And she's accrued like hundreds of millions of dollars in that time. And like, I don't know exactly how, you know? Like, I don't know. I get her husband's just really good at picking stocks or something like that. Some insider trading is legal, while some of it is illegal, but all of it is corrupt. Politicians and corporate leaders use it to further their agenda and keep their pockets full with no concern for how it impacts the life or wallet of the average American citizen. If you actually trace the history of almost any, regula uh, any regulation and the, or regulatory body, these things were lobbied into existence by those industries. Very wealthy interests within these industries lobbied for this regulation because it's a great way to keep your competitors out of, of an industry. The key point just stated was lobbying, a term everyone has probably heard of, but few truly understand. Let's imagine, again, that you're an extremely successful business executive, and your business has nearly maxed out its potential profits, and you see a way to make a bunch of money outside of the law. Instead of breaking it, you can simply change it. Welcome to the shady business of lobbying. Can you quantify how much it costs to corrupt a congressman? <laughs> I was actually thinking of writing a book, uh, The Idiot's Guide to Buying a Congressman. This is Jack Abramoff, the most notorious lobbyist and now convicted felon. How many congressional offices did you actually own? <laughs> uh, we probably had very strong influence in a hundred offices at a time. <gasps> Come on. No. Abramoff was an expert at controlling government from the outside. He mastered the art of pushing secret agreements through political offices. 
Just get him the money and he'll get it done. We crafted language that was so obscure, so confusing, so uninformative, but so precise to change the U.S. code. Here's what you tried to get right. tacked on to this reform bill. Yep. Public Law 100-89 is amended by striking Section 207, paren, 101, stat, period, 668, comma, 672, close paren. Right, now isn't that obvious what that means? <laughs> uh, it was perfect. It was perfect. And his services weren't cheap. He charged clients as high as $180,000 per month. You see, those pesky laws and regulations, those are for the poor. These guidelines are not only ignored by the rich, but made by the rich. A system of the rich, by the rich, for the rich. These corporate warlords often use lobbyists to get an edge over their competitors. They do this behind some sort of guise that makes them look like the good guy. Remember when Amazon pushed for higher minimum wage for employees? That sounds like a good thing at first, but in reality, they were automating away their minimum wage jobs anyway, and just wanted to put financial pressure on their competitors. This is why big businesses support the minimum wage being raised, because it doesn't. It, that's okay for them, but it destroys a mom and pop shop. So like they're the ones who can't afford to like pay some kid who's worth eight bucks an hour, 25 bucks an hour. Um, whereas the big businesses, they have, they can get away with it. Basically, your business is hiring lobbyists to make sure that government policy reflects your interests. This could even be to simply keep government out of your business. Like how big tech spent half a billion dollars lobbying the government from 2005 to 2018. Although it's possible government was the one who was infiltrating big tech. The degree to which uh, various government agencies had effectively had full access to everything that was going on on Twitter uh, blew my mind. At the end of the day, the line between big business and government is so blurry that the two are nearly impossible to distinguish. For too long, we in Washington have been lying to you. We say we're here to serve you when, in fact, we're serving ourselves. And why? We are driven by our own desire to get reelected. Our need to stay in power eclipses our duty to govern. That ends tonight. Tonight, I give you the truth. And the truth is this. The American dream has failed you. So what do you get when you create a system with greedy politicians, lobbied lawmakers, and captured agencies? You get a corporatocracy. Whatever you want to call it, you know, like corporatism. Uh, I like corporatocracy. Um, I, you know, fascism is not a bad way to describe it either. A place where corporations' interests are valued above the people's interests. And politicians are sold to the highest bidder. Now the term fascism might sound hyperbolic to you, but it is actually the precise definition that the Italian dictator Mussolini said. Fascism should rightly be called corporatism, as it is the merger of corporate and government power. A, a more broader, proper understanding of fascism is kind of this marriage of private industry and government, with government kind of dictating things through private organizations. And in that sense, we're a very fascistic country. Taxing the rich to give to the poor is a highly debated issue in today's society. The opposing argument is usually something along the lines of, the rich make life better for the poor through things like capital investment. But this debate is outdated. Neither side addresses the fundamental problem that we are dealing with. We don't live in a country that taxes the rich to help out to help out the poor, and we don't live in a laissez-faire free market. What we actually live in is a country where big business owns the government and they get tremendous like bailouts and corporate welfare from the working and middle class to the wealthy class, which like no one can defend in theory. And I think a big part of that is why you see such like perversions in the market. It's like, why, why are these giant corporations doing government's bidding all the time? And the truth is because it's much more important to be in with government than in with your customers. Think about this problem from the business owner's perspective. 
obviously the business owner's motive is profit. So they're faced with the question, are there more returns for serving the will of the people or the government? Companies like BlackRock are making it increasingly difficult for businesses to serve the will of the people. I'm now being attacked equally by the left and the right, so I'm doing something right, I hope. But BlackRock is an interesting example because instead of infiltrating the government, they decided to infiltrate other businesses like the media. You have to force behaviors, and at BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. The media is merely a source of potential profit, and narratives are sold to the highest bidder. It should be a real concern to all Americans that all of our major television networks are owned by very, very powerful and wealthy corporations who very clearly have a conflict of interest in terms of what they present on the air. And I think what we have got to ask ourselves, are corporations like these going to provide objective information to the American people? I think the answer is very clearly no. As Bernie just said, media corruption is alive and well. It is an ever-shifting cesspool of government agents, corporate overlords, and foreign influence. One thing is clear is that you're not getting the truth. You're getting a narrative. This should come as no surprise, as the public trust in legacy media is at historic lows. We now stand 10 years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. Three of these involved our own country. Despite these holocausts, America is today the strongest, the most influential, and most productive nation in the world. Understandably proud of this preeminence, we yet realize that America's leadership and prestige depend not merely upon our unmatched material progress, riches, and military strength, but on how we use our power in the interest of world peace and human better. We are now in the business of war. Due to the military-industrial complex, the network of people and companies involved in the production of weapons and military tech. It may not seem strange that a factory should produce 250,000 machine guns. The strange thing is that only a short time before, these factories were producers of electric refrigerators. A network which former President Dwight Eisenhower starkly warned us about in his farewell address. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. A warning which we haven't taken seriously enough. The military industrial complex is right at the center of it. I mean, it's the, this is the whole thing. The vast majority of the budget is the military entitlements and, and interest on the debt. That's like the whole government, basically. The United States war machine has only been amplified and expanded since Eisenhower's speech. But this is what you get when you create an entire industry that profits from war. You have these think tanks that are funded by weapons companies who lobby for war. The result of which not only creates death and destruction abroad, but moral decay at home. I mean, how can you morally stand for anything when there's innocent blood on your hands? There's this great uh, John Adams quote, and I'll probably butcher it a little bit. What a brilliant quote for at the time of the founding of the country to say this. If America goes around the world looking for monsters to destroy, we will become the dictress of the world, but we will lose our own soul. So what is the solution? How do we stop the infiltration and corruption? 
Can we get the right people in power to truly enact the necessary change? I do not believe in infiltrating the federal government and like reforming it back. I mean, if someone tries to do that, best of luck to them. What I believe in is that I believe ideas are powerful. And I believe that like waking people up and spreading this message is important. And what I believe in is trying to seize political power at the local level. That's where I think things are gonna be won. Corporatocracy. Good. Corporatocracy. <laughs> Dude, I feel so strange doing this.